Okay, hey everyone. I see a bunch of participants coming in. We are so excited to have you. As you are starting to come in, if you wouldn't mind dropping your LinkedIn link into the chat so we can start connecting with all of you. Um, we're gonna have a really great discussion today and uh, we're so excited that you're here. Also, where are you from? What are you guys doing right now? Where are you from? What do you do? If you wanna throw that into the chat, Katie, thank you for throwing your link in there. I know some of you are joining us from all over the world today. So it's going to be so much fun. Um, Katie's from JTRAP, an energy efficiency sustainability software. That's pretty cool. That's very exciting. Hey, Bob, welcome from Fairfax. We've got some VPs in here. This is really exciting. Some people out in Philly. I know uh, Philadelphia has been a hot topic of conversation lately. So I, I hope this is a very welcome reprieve for you. Um, here we go, Appfolio, wonderful company. Tanner, so excited to have you. Um, Jamal, why don't you tell us where are you coming from right now? You gotta unmute yourself. <laughs> I, I am in the Florida of Sweden. I'm in, the, <laughs> I'm in the very Southern part of Sweden. Okay. What's uh what's the weather like? Anything fun happening there? I wouldn't use Swedish weather and fun in the same sentence, but um, it's uh, it's kind of like the UK weather, you know, typically kind of overcast, but we've had some pretty nice weather the last couple of weeks. True, true fall stuff, nice and sunny and crispy. I love that. Yeah, it's, we're just now starting to get our leaves to change. I'm coming from DFW, Texas, and so it has been freezing for a week and then really hot again and then cold again. And uh, I'm ready for a little bit of consistency. Hey, Natalie, welcome. Joining from South Carolina, we're excited to have you. Southern Sweden is still good compared to other parts. Malmo, where's that? I don't know anything about, about 20, 20 minutes, 20 minutes from my house. I live in Lund. Lund, that is great. And Andrew, you are joining us from your little vacation hotspot. You want to share uh, yeah, <laughs> joining from Mexico. Yep, yep. So um, opposite weather of Sweden there. But yeah, joining <laughs> from Mexico today. And look, we have some great people joining us today too. Hi, Annie. Nice to see you, Annie. Uh, Annie's in Mexico too. Great. Um, Ayush, Southern Sweden. Look at Michael, Vancouver, BC. Cool, cool. Got lots of folks joining. Ah, Katie, Katie's been to Sweden. Awesome. Yes, yeah. the lack of light is difficult. The only way to survive Sweden <laughs> Swedish summer uh, winters is to leave for a few weeks, like smack in the middle of it to get some sun. Wow. That's why there's so many Swedes in Thailand, Andrew, as you were talking about Thailand. Oh uh, yeah, really? Swedes. Okay, okay. I get that sun. Nice. Well, hey everyone, if you are just hopping in, I know we're still waiting on a few people to get in here. Don't forget, drop your LinkedIn link so we can all connect with you. Tell us where you're from. Tell us what you do. I would love to hear how many of you are in sales management. How many of you are um, either an individual contributor, an SDR, AE, or wanting to be promoted into management. And you're thinking you're going to get info from this webinar to just spur your growth in your sales career. Wherever you're at, we want to hear from you. Max, great to see you here. Let's see. And we're just going to get started here in a little bit. We've got a lot of people coming from BC. So San Francisco, London. That's one of my favorite things about Sales Hacker. And if you don't know, we have a fabulous online community with super active discussion boards, AMAs. A lot of our webinars come from that. You name it. Um, so shameless plug, join at saleshacker.com. Um, during this event this morning, if you have any questions whatsoever, throw them into the little Q&A box at the bottom. Or if you don't know where that is, I had no idea until I came to this side of things. I had no clue where that box was. Um, you can also throw them into the chat. We want this to be so interactive and super fun. Um, and so we want to hear from y'all and, and make sure that you guys are getting everything you want out of this. Hey, we've got another person from Texas. Welcome, welcome. 
Um, so as we get started, I just want to introduce myself here. My name is Katie Ray. I am the Community Engagement Manager for Sales Hacker. So um, we are just so excited to have you part of the discussion today. In case you forgot what you registered for, but knew you had to click on a link somewhere, today we are talking all things enterprise, really focusing in on multi-threaded approaches, sealing the deal, you name it. So it's going to be, like I said, super interactive. Drop your questions into the Q&A. Any question you have, you don't even have to wait for us to get to that part. Throw it in there. We're going to be answering things as we go. Um, and I'm going to let Jamal introduce himself, then Andrew, and then we're going to get started. Ready for me? Hey. Yeah, oh, yeah, there we go, Jamal. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, so I'm I'm Jamal, Jamal Reimer. I live in southern Sweden. Uh, I'm a longtime individual contributor. I've been selling software and services and tech for 19 years. And uh, I was at Oracle for about 13 years, and I just left this summer. And since then, I, I'm, I'm out on my own. And my, my main thing is helping coach enterprise sellers on how to sell really large deals. Love that. Yep. And hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Mewborn. I'm an empo uh, early employee over at Outreach.io. And for about the fa past five years or so, uh, I've been working with hundreds of organizations on their sales process, on sales tactics, um, and working with great sales individual contributors like Jamal here, as well as great sales leaders. So excited to get into the multi-threading approach today um, and give you all some great nuggets to take home with you wherever you are. Um, especially, let's see, Danica, you're from Toronto, so we can give you some nuggets to take home in Toronto there, right? So, cool, let's get into it, Katie. Awesome. So, Andrew, I'll let you start asking Jamal some great questions, and then, like I said, everybody, throw your questions either in the chat or throw them in the Q&A box, and we'll be able to answer them as they're going, so. Perfect. Let's do it. So uh, what are the three or four takeaways that everyone's going to learn today? Again, the, the holistic topic here is going to be multi-threading into enterprise accounts. Um, but here's the takeaways we want to give you all today. So uh, the first, how to discover priorities of each stakeholder in an enterprise deal. Okay. Secondly, how do we how do we tailor your demo conversations to the priorities of each stakeholder um, in, your in your enterprise deals? Third, how do we read 10K reports and analyze quarterly analyst calls? Jamal, who is on the line as well, is the guru on this, so cannot wait for that part. Um, and then Alex, uh, who's listening in, if you want to put a link to a previous conversation we had on how to read 10Ks, that'd be great as well. Um, so that will be part of the discussion today. And then lastly, the, mo the most common multi-threading mistakes and how to avoid them. So we'll go ahead and get into those topics today. Um, and why don't we go ahead and get started? And, you know, let's start from uh, the basics. Jamal, I want to hear from you. What does it mean to be multi-threaded in an organization and why should people be multi-threaded in these enterprise deals? So multi-threading in, in any selling situation, in any B2B situation, basically means having more than one contact within an account. So many of us have lots of accounts and we're smiling and dialing and going through the, our, our prospecting process. And, uh, you know, there, there's a lot for, depending on your role and, and the size and volume of, uh, you know, the size of your territory and the, the volume of outbound that you're doing, you're going to get a lot of rejection. And most of us, when we finally get somebody who talked to us, we just love to hold on to that relationship and just nurture it. Like it's, you know, God, God's gift to my sales process which is exactly the opposite of expanding across an organization to talk with lots of stakeholders. So in short, multi-threading means to be engaged with multiple stakeholders within an account. And let's get into the nuts and bolts here, uh, Jamal. So where do reps start when multi-threading into enterprise deal? Let's say, I know I'm a rep, right? I know I need to have marketing. I know I need to have sales. I know I need to have sales enablement, sales development, IT, all these folks. Like, when do I start that process exactly? I, I start from the first call. I mean, should we just, see, we just get into the meat? Like, Let's just, just get, get into, into the meat, the meat. Right just off. get into the meat. Yeah, just get into right. the meat. <laughs> so the, the, my experience with multi-threading and accounts actually started with my first selling experience, which was selling books door to door. 
in college. I used to sell books door to door. There were this, there was these study guides and there was a bunch of college kids. They were the only people who sold the books, college kids every summer. And uh, my first summer, I absolutely sucked. After working 13 weeks, 80 hours a week, I brought home $2,200. I absolutely sucked at selling. And the, the, the experience was so hard. I was, I was terrified of it. So I had to come back to do it again. So I, I couldn't leave something that terrifying in my life, just giving me nightmares every night. So I, I tackled it again. But the, this time, uh, my, my student manager had me follow someone who was an awesome, awesome sales rep. So I'm just standing there while they're going to the door and they're, they, you know, they're going through their approach. The, the Mrs. Jones, as we always say, Mrs. Jones opens the door and he immediately launches into, hey, I'm so-and-so from this university. And I'm talking with all the families in this neighborhood about uh, the, the set of study guides that everybody's going to be using. And he starts rolling off all these names of all the families and all the kids' names of everybody on the street, everybody in the neighborhood, everybody in the, 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 the kids of the family's class. And all of a sudden, this, this woman just says, come on in. <laughs> you know, she just had to know what was going on that all of her friends and neighbors and you know community members were a part of and i just took that approach and i brought it into prospecting in the b2b scenario so what i do is you know if i'm calling it hey andrew i'm jamal i'm from oracle and i sell software and i'm not even sure if you're the right person to talk with but i'm having conversations with a lot of your colleagues about X business topic. I don't talk about products. I don't talk about features or functions. I don't even talk about software. I'm talking about X business issue, like so and so and so and so. And I name all the people who I've done research in LinkedIn who are who are who are, who are uh, around them. And that does a number of things right off the bat. Number one, it immediately um, lets them know that I'm already loose in the account and having conversations. And so it absolutely stops the, the dreaded, oh my gosh, now I've talked to this guy for en enough times, I need to get higher in the account, but man, am I going to tick him off if I go over his head? It completely eliminates that because from the first conversation, they already know that you, you know who's who in the zoo and you've done your research and maybe you're even talking to him already. So I don't want to go on too long, but you asked me, when do you start multi-threading in an account? And my response is immediately upon the first call and in every call. So I've got, I've got a question for you, Jamal. Why does that matter? Why, why do we put in that extra work to try and talk <clears throat> with 15 people where only eight of them may have somewhat of a say versus just trying to go straight to the CISO or whatever? Well, there's a lot of value in getting straight to somebody who's very senior, but oftentimes if, if you're going in cold or relatively cold, you're going to have one shot with that senior stakeholder. You got to make it count. So you got to do your homework. Now there's different types of homework. You can do homework on the individual. You can do homework on the technical landscape. If you need to know that to, to tell your story better, you, you know, there's lots of contextual um, discovery that should be done to take that one shot with, with the CISO. But let's say, you're, let, let's say you're in a sales cycle and your main contact is one person and maybe it's not the CISO. If it is or if it isn't, what you're doing is you are creating one of those, uh, in Indiana Jones, that kind of tightrope bridge, you know, between two mountains. <laughs> yeah. And it's like one way to get yeah. from where you are to where you're trying to go. And all it takes is to snip two cords and that whole bridge is gone and you're, there's no way you're crossing that ravine. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, while you're, while you're uh, multi-threaded, you basically got multiple bridges to get across the river. So that's great, great uh, explanation. We've got a message here from Shannon. So she's recently had to make the switch from a, a BDR that's really dealing with SMB mid-market to enterprise. And so really focusing on this multi-threaded uh, approach, but what she seems to be struggling is how do you figure out who are the right people to talk to? You know, she knows her ICP, she knows the type of buyer she wants, but how do you know, you know, who you're going to be spending this time with instead of just 
you know, talking to five gatekeepers? Do you talk with the gatekeeper, the network admin, the IT director? How do you, how do you figure out which ones to talk to? Um, well, I, firstly, whenever speaking with anyone within an account, just, just be a human being. Yeah. You know, don't be a smiler and dialer and, and don't have any kind of affect in your voice where you're trying to pump them up and be super duper friendly. Just be a normal human being. And, you know, that, yeah. Unless you are that super duper happy. Okay. If you are, fine. Be, be whoever you are. How about that? Um, but the, the, the point is just be sincere and authentic. Yeah. And as you're being sincere and authentic, as I'm going through what I'm trying to convey to the person, you know, so I would say, hey, you know, Katie, I, I work at Oracle. I sell software. The software deals with this kind of area. And, you know, you might be the right person to talk about this or, or, or not, because I'm having conversations with other, but it's really dealing with XYZ business issue. Mm. And if that touches your world, I would really love to get your input on just a couple of things. Like, and then I, I start having a business. I ask them about, you know, what's it like for you when you're trying to, da, 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 da. is that hard or easy? Or, you know, and, and I start to ask them, what's their work life like? Yeah. If they respond and they know what the heck I'm talking about and they can have a, a, a relevant response, then we have a dialogue. And as we do, I'm just looking for, can we even help this person? And along the way in the conversation, I start to talk about, okay, so if this is the issue that you face in this business process, are you the only one? Does it hit others? You know, okay, it, now if we're talking about a team, who does that team roll up to? Who's really going to have the, who's going to care enough about this issue and the ability to fix it? Yeah. That's really and and you, 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 you're just having a normal conversation, but you're just always looking. So if this is an issue, how, what's the scope of it and where does it roll up to? And yeah. And then I, I oftentimes I give a lot of power to them or at least so it feels because I'm like, what do you think we should do? I mean, it, it, scale of one to 10, how much of an issue is this? And if it's above a five, I'm like, okay, well, maybe we should have some more conversations and maybe get some other folks involved. I really loved your little verbiage on ability to fix it because you're using buyer conversation terms and people don't want to say, no, I can't fix it. Right. Like that's, <laughs> I don't want to say I can't fix it. So I really love that little nugget. Um, I usually had sent us a little message here asking about RFPs and I know I've had to deal with this on, well, you can do a multi-threaded approach if you talk to the business before the RFP even comes out and build those relationships in advance. But I, I don't even know how does this work during an RFP in your, you know, kind of stronghold into just dealing with procurement. What, what would you suggest with that? It, it's a tough spot. I mean, that's <laughs> why I'm a big fan of um, either not responding to RFPs or I do, I do pushback on RFPs. So if I get an RFP and we have a read and I go through the, with, with, you know, either my pre-sales person or some part of my team, and if it doesn't look like something that's absolutely tailored for us, I'll basically work with the team to give me the ammo that I need to go back to the customer and say, you know, I, I can tell you spent a lot of time on this RFP. But if you're trying, what I, what it looks like is you're trying to achieve X. Is that right? And if that's right, I say, I don't think we can help you because we're not going to, we would achieve X a very different way. And we don't even think X is the right thing for you. It's probably more like Y. And I haven't earned the right to really kind of go through this. I'm happy to do it if you want to, but we're, I'm, thank you for bringing this to us, but we're not going to respond with this RP as it is. Yeah, that's really good. Interesting. Yeah, and I want to kind of hit on a point that Shannon, uh, on her question that she asked earlier too, is, is, is Shannon, as you're moving in that BDR, from that BDR role to the enterprise role, um, one thing to look at too is, you know, look at how previous deals were done in the past. Ask the other reps on the enterprise side to, and look at their mutual action plans that they use. How did they get the deal done? Who was involved? And in part of that process, you're going to make some hypotheses on, on who actually should be involved in the process on their end, right? And this all goes back to discovering what Jamal was saying. 
you know, when, when you have those initial conversations with particular stakeholders, right, maybe it's the, the first person you're meeting with in that account, um, collaborating with them and asking, hey, it looks like Johnny, Sally, and, and, and Sarah would be involved in this process at some point. Am I right in that? Or, you know, are they working on other projects that, that have nothing to do with, you know, what you're trying to solve? Um, and again, if we want to go into that, um, that Alex linked that article um, here in the chat, but um, that all comes down to doing your homework beforehand, right? And making an assumption or a hypothesis on who exactly needs to be involved based on how deals have been done in the past, um, right? So if you look like at a sales platform, if any of you are all selling sales tech or some type of MarTech here, uh, you maybe will involve marketing, sales, enablement, IT, and these other departments. So if that's how deals have been done in the past, then don't reinvent the wheel, right? Utilize those same departments and when you're trying to get into these accounts and in those initial conversations and do your homework and knowing who those people might be specifically to. So I just wanted to call that out there. That's a really good point. We've got a question here from Melissa. This is uh, this is actually really interesting and I love I love her response. This may be an overly polite Canadian problem, but <laughs> What are your strategies for multi-threading, but not wanting to step on the toes of your champion? For example, if we do a demo and the CMO attends and is interested, how do you approach setting up a conversation with the CMO without offending your champion? So I'm assuming she means the champion is separate from the CMO in this. Do you cut them out? Do you allow them to be a part of that conversation? What do you do with them? I can start here, Jamal, then if you want to go into it. <laughs> um, one, one, I've already kind of alluded to this. One thing that um, works for me is uh, a, it's, a, it's walking a balance between giving a lot of power and choice and voice to uh, all customer stakeholders, as well as trying to guide the conversation in a direction that you know is right for them. So in this example, if I had kind of the number one and number two in the room and the number two was the person that set it up and number one, who's really holding the keys to the kingdom, I would basically in that meeting, uh, engage both of them in the dialogue. And so, you know, you ask number two a question, you ask number one a question. And when, when I would get to the number one, it, I would basically say something like, well, it sounds like you're really engaged in this and it sounds like you've got a lot of opinions uh, what's the right way to work with you to kind of work through all that stuff? We can do some of it here, but we only got 20 minutes left. Should we set up some next steps? Do you want to, you know, trade emails? What do you want to do? And I leave it to them. And when they state what they want to do, which links me to them, number two really can't say anything. And it's just a natural part of the conversation. And something to add to that, if you do have a CMO that attends, I would bring in your CMO for that meeting as well. Right. Mm -hmm. See others to give their perspective. And as part of the agenda, what I would set up is in the agenda, I'd say, look, hey, I have my CMO on the line here. And if you if you were able to get your CMO on the line there um, and as a next step here, typically what we do is set up a separate conversation just between my CMO and your CMO to give you some level of value in our perspective on our product or this business issue or have they how they've handled it in the past. So leveraging your CMO to continue the conversation with that CMO because CMO executives like to speak to other executives, right? I mean, it's much easier for them to continue that conversation with other executives. Um, just to be straightforward here, like you, if you get them on the line once, you emailing them and getting them on the line again is gonna be very tough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, leveraging your CMO to build that relationship. And again, that's part of multi-threading, right? Is connecting C-level executives at your organization to C-level executives at other organizations. I actually learned a lot of this from Jamal. So uh, shout out to Jamal and his masterclass on that one. But uh, that has been very successful there. Um, and again, if you do have those executives join your meeting, for sure, for sure, for sure, get your executives involved as well. Some of you may be like freaking out right now because... I remember the first time that I talked with my VP of sales and I said, look, I am prospecting the other VPs. Would this, would this method resonate with you? What are your thoughts? And he was like, look, if you get a call and it's with someone really high up, just ask me, I'll fly out for the customer meeting. So some of you, this could be the first time you're hearing this, ask your higher execs if you have a good relationship. And even if you don't, 
ask them because many of them one want to be able to do something like that and see the process and be a part of that relationship but exactly what andrew said a lot of you know above the line execs they want to talk with other execs and so making that relationship and it's really great networking anyways um so don't be afraid to ask because a lot of times you'll probably get some really good responses so Let's see, we've got another question. Oh my gosh, I know we're not really sticking to the script today. So <laughs> welcome to uh, Mr. Toad's wild ride here. <laughs> so Jamal, another question we have, how do you multi-thread, excuse me, if the stakeholder you have an initial discussion with typically has an aversion to what you're selling because their job may be harder as a result of buying it? Oh, I love this. This is yeah, a great question, uh, Jason. It, it, it's, a, it's very valid. And um, so let's just be clear. There, there's no magic bullet. And sometimes you're just kind of stuck and they're going to sour the conversation and make things difficult because um, your solution is a risk to them in some way. That Sometimes that's just kind of where it's at. But in, in the approach that I use, because I'm immediately mentioning other people, I'm, I'm signaling that, hey, I'm happy to talk to you, but you're not the only person I'm talking to. And so immediately they understand that I'm having an institutional conversation, not, not only this, this one-on-one. -on -one. So um, mentally it, it has either erased or highly reduced any pushback that I get when I speak with others anyway. And I, I, I try to make the, the, the canvassing of at least several stakeholders rather quick so that I can actually have multiple people to talk. If one of them goes sour or goes dark or you know starts to make trouble, I've got these others to kind of balance out the conversation. Um, and you know, a Andrew's great point about using executives. It's like I don't know if you anybody ever watched like the original Star Trek, oh but <laughs> there was there was an episode or two, you know. Chess, as we know it, the game of chess is a, is a two-dimensional game, right? It's on a flat board. But in, in a couple of Star Wars episodes, they had this three-dimensional chess. There were like two or three boards on top of each other, and you could move the piece from here to here and all stuff. When you introduce, uh, I call it executive whispering. If you start to introduce different levels of executives, both on your side and theirs, that's like uber multi-threading and then some one person who is feeling a threat or is in some way down on what you do is going to be mitigated by all these other developing relationships from all these other stakeholders that are like yeah i want to get rid of those people that that other woman has because they're just a drag on our bottom line and we don't need the people if we can get tech to do the same thing interesting Andrew, I'm sure you've you've probably had to uh, face this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say in every deal, there's you know at least a large deal, there's going to be someone uh, that is not going to be happy with with what's going on, right? Um, so, in that case, there's a you know this is the importance of multi-threading, right? It's not relying on one single person that may be the blocker or may you know find it harder their job harder with your system but um i think one perspective here is again bringing in someone at that person's level that can talk through the system and hopefully make them feel more comfortable about what it really is like to integrate this system and why it's low cost of ownership overall on their end um and also you know relying on your champion or someone that's an influencer to help get in that person's ear to help them understand like, Hey, this is the priority of the business, not the priority of, you know, uh, what you want to do today or tomorrow. Right. So, um, at the end of the day, that going back to the beginning here it, and why discovery is so important. We always talk about discovery, right? That's why it's important to understand the business priorities, right? Like, that is going to triumph what anyone cares about how hard it is to flip a knob or flip a switch on your product. Right. Um, if the business priority is to, you know, create a Delta between X, Y, and Z and an increase in, you know, ABC, whatever it may be. Um, that's what you can go back and rely on. And again, that comes back to, you know, that multi-threading approach, understanding the priorities of multiple stakeholders in the deal. 
We've got another question. I'm speaking with other people at your organization. When we say that, are we being true? I know that yeah. there's definitely some sales leaders out there that say, oh, well, it's really, you know, it's fine. <laughs> it's not fine, right? What, how do you, how do you respond to that if, if you are being false in it or do you even go through that approach? Well, so the way that I, the way that I read the question is really, hey, in your first call, Mm -hmm. When you haven't talked with anybody else yet, what do you say? So what, what I say is, hey, hey, Katie, I'm Jamal. I'm from Oracle. I sell software. It does this kind of stuff. And I've got a whole list of people that I'm going to be calling to have this conversation with. And you're the first one. Now, I don't know if you face these issues or not, but I wanted to get your input on it. And then we dive into the conversation. Mm -hmm. So you always want to be truthful. You know, you don't want to be anything else. But just naming all of the people just gives the, the gives, puts them on notice that you know who the players are and, yeah. and you're, you're not kind of driving your truck into one garage into which you're going to get stuck. You know, you're, you're out on kind of this, this open roadway. Mm. Yeah. And I've seen it work too, Jamal, to build on that. Um, we did a, a podcast recently with Tom Wentworth. He's a CMO at Recorded Future. And in, in talking with him, I said, you know, Tom, when, when, some, when you're going through a buying cycle yourself, like it, what keeps you engaged? And he goes, you know, what keeps me engaged is knowing that my fellow CMOs at other companies are using the, your same product or interested in your same product because I am doing myself a disservice to my business if I am not using what other top companies are using themselves. So when it goes to the multi-thread, everyone like, yeah, you can multi-thread your organization, but to get that conversation and going back to that, like, you know, it, it's leveraging that FOMO, right? And understanding that, hey, people at the exact level that you're speaking to, they all want to understand what everyone else is doing right? Don't you, we all, we're, that's why we're on this call, right? We all, we want to understand what other account executives, what other ICs are doing. Um, so, you know, when it comes down to that, like also, you know, leveraging names of folks that those people may be interested in, right? That's also a way to, to, to go about that situation well, too. Well, let, let's be clear. You're adding a new layer to multi-threading by bringing in stakeholders from other customers. Mm. And when you find yourself in a market where you have a community of your customers, you just, the scenario that you just laid out were CMOs, right? When you have that community of CMOs, you can absolutely leverage it because the FOMO is absolutely there. I mean, I, I was just in a case last week where uh, I was consulting with the company. We were on the phone with one of their board members because we were going to be doing some uh, executive work with, with their network. And, um, yeah, he was just, um, uh, he, he was saying how important it is, this, this FOMO is, is so real. So there was a company who got a lot of traction around one product and everybody used them for that one product. And then they started to build these other products. And he said, you know, when they came to me that they were building this other product, I was highly skeptical, skeptical because it was, it was a reach from their knowledge base of what they knew how to build but I didn't want to miss out because everybody was waiting for this product. So I told my team, just go get a POC going just to make sure. So that's just kind of some social proof to add to the idea that, you know, when, when you can do multi-threading within an account, but you can start to use that concept outwardly to the customers and it's, it's hugely effective. So I, I know we've got a, a little bit of a limited time here. I'd love for us to kind of go into more of what some of these like common multi-threading mistakes are or jump into the 10K report and some questions. I know Alex has dropped in some, um, some links to your masterclass and um, a more deeper conversation about the 10K. So what would you like to focus on first? Yeah, I think something uh, like common multi-threading mistakes, right? And I've done it. I'm sure a lot of folks have done it. Uh, very common. You know, you're, you're going through a deal. You're, you're three, six, nine months in, however, and you relied on one person, one department, and the deal starts to go sour. And then you say, well, we should, well who else can we get involved, 
right? What other C-level executive would be involved, would, would like this, right? And it's, it's really starting too late on the multi-threading process. And this goes back to what Jamal was saying at the beginning, start it early, right? This starts at your first conversation, making a hypothesis of who else should be involved or who you know should be involved, right? And, and making that assumption and trying to do that from the get-go. Um, so yeah, I think going back to, you know, the takeaway here is like starting it too late in the process when the deal is going sour, right? Um, super common mistake. I think getting to it early um, and often and trying to multi-thread it. If you know the departments that sh should be involved, right? Get them involved. <laughs> if you know that's how it's supposed to be done, uh, don't assume that, you know, you can just put it off until later and procrastinate, right? Like just go for it now and start that multi-threading process in terms of, you know, working with your champion to understand who those people are and coming up with a strategy and how to approach this conversation with them, whether that's with you yourself or getting your other executives involved to basically help get that conversation on the books. Let me, let me add to that, Katie. Another mistake is thinking you're doing a good job multi-threading when you have three or four connections, but not getting more of your team involved in the multi-threading process. So if you go back to the chess analogy, you're never going to win a game of chess if you, your pawn is the only piece on your side that you're playing against a full team on the other. So your customer has everybody in place, the CEO, the CFO, the business head, the IT guy, the procurement guy, the legal guy, they're all there. And if you're the only one, even if you're trying to take them all, take them all on, it's supposed to be, you don't want to be fighting your customer, but you get the analogy. You got to bring your whole team, right? You're inviting everybody to a dance. You got to introduce everybody. And so if you think you're doing a good job of multi-threading and you are the hub of all the relationships, you're, you're way missing out. You're mm. way missing out because all these other relationships are super important to, uh, to ignite. Yeah. And I th something else to add on that is um, something very common, you know, I see too, is like the conversation stops after your champion brings in other stakeholders. So say they bring in a CMO, right. And you bring in your CMO, they say hi to each other. Hey, I'm a CMO. You're a CMO too. You know, we're both awesome execs. Right. And then after that meeting, they never speak again. So I think having not an output of that meeting for both CMOs is also important. And that comes down to briefing your execs before they get on, you know, before they get in that meeting. If you're bringing in execs to your meeting to meet with other execs on the customer end, briefing them. And I have a, a briefing document somewhere um, that I'll put out there, but uh, briefing them, I'm like, Hey, here's what we, our next step is or our goal for you, Mr. And Mrs. CMO at my company after this meeting, we want you to meet with the CMO again, right? And here's how you're going to meet with the CMO again. Here's a strategy we can pitch, right? Hey, let's talk about like how you increased ROI on, you know, inbound source leads, yada, 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 and what's, what you put in place to do that, right? Let's set that up so we can keep the conversation going, all right? And I think where we, where we make the mistake again is bringing them on the call, but then either not having them say anything that adds up any value or not having any action items um, to go after this after that call so yeah you've got to have those the next steps right I mean so many of us I'm sure I'm not going to make you raise your hands but I know so many of us we've always struggled with next steps or we think the call's going so well so we get incredibly excited or maybe that's just me but I get incredibly excited and <laughs> I, I'm like, oh, it's fine. Great. We'll talk soon. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> He's never going to call me back. <laughs> um, I, I know we've got another question here. So one of the things, Jamal, that you had said was uh, had really inspired our anonymous attendees question about how do you communicate the detractors or how do you find the detractors early on and how do you turn that around? Um, or as we begin this relationship in a multi-threaded approach? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, m my effort is to, so the ideal, you never really reach the ideal, right? I, the ideal is like perfection, but it, we can always try to strive towards it. So my ideal situation is to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with every stakeholder that's going to be a part of the decision even if they are a part of like a voting block, they're not like a decision maker, but they're a part of like a, a voting, like, like a group of users, right? Mm. Even if I never get there, I'm gonna try. 
Yeah. And if I'm if I'm trying to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with every stakeholder, that means that I'm always reaching out. Hey, Katie, you know, we should have a we, we meet in meetings, but we never meet on one. We should do, you know, 10 minutes on Zoom next week. What do you think? Andrew, same with you. And through and through the just the reaching out and you know, kind of a gut check here. Does this person want to meet with me or not? Some folks will just avoid you. And then you got to look into, are they just super busy? Do they think that this is beneath them or are they against my cause? Yeah. And then once you get to that next level, you, you don't want to confront them like, hey, let's, you know, but you do want to communicate, you know, and just sometimes you got to do it by email if they're not going to respond. But, you know, you, 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 you want to be forthright. And what I say is, hey, it looks like we're there's some real buy-in or some some momentum growing with this whole concept, but I sense that you're really holding back, and maybe you're not seeing any benefits for your job or your role or whatever. And if that's the case, I I just would really love to know because either you're not being included in the right way, and we need your voice. If this is going to work, we're going to need your voice. But if it's not going to work, I really also want to know why because we have to. We have to make that a part of the equation if we're ever going to get to a go no go decision, and in it's another way to invite an honest dialogue, right? And even if they disagree, you're giving them the space to do that in a way that isn't going to escalate. Um, but that's that's an approach I take, uh, Andrew. What do you think? Yeah, I'd call that out early. Exactly, I call it out early too. Um, again, not waiting until we it magically goes away. If, if people make an opinion, they're typically going to keep that opinion, uh, as we all know. Um, and so the earlier you can address it, the better, right? Um, versus going on for nine, 12 months and then wait, saying, well, I, I just hope they change their mind about that you know, thing that they don't like, right? Um, calling out as soon as possible and just putting it out there, I think is the, as soon as you figure that out, that's the biggest takeaway, I would say, in, in your approach there, Jamal, um, and not waiting weeks, days, months, however long, but just trying to get that cleared up as soon as possible. So I know that we are kind of coming towards end of our time here. So I think inquiring minds want to know what are maybe one or two little pieces of advice that we may not have covered today that you would want to give, give to our team that's here um, to really help either encourage them, remind them, you name it. What does that look like? On, on on the topic of multi-threading or yes yeah um it's just um it, it's almost a review because it it, it start early mm -hmm. it, because it, it's like a garden you got to plant those seeds and then let them grow it's not like flowers are just gonna show up <laughs> and y y you just got to start right away and so often we don't realize the value of multi-threading until it's way too late to make any changes. You know, Andrew said, Andrew's talked about starting it too late. Um, it, it, I, I, you know, I've been selling for 19 years and I'll still run into situations where I'm single threaded either because I've gotten lazy or because um, it hasn't worked, right? I've, I've tried and it, I can really only get one person to really engage. And, and that's never a good sign. So it, it, it's just all, always be threading. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you, you never want to stop. You, you, you always got to take the pulse of everybody if you're going to try to drive toward that ideal. So yeah. ABC is gone. We've got ABT. ABT, <laughs> ABT. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's some fluffy stat out there that is like, you know, each you know, enterprise deals, it takes about eight or eight, nine stakeholders um, to get a deal closed, right? So uh, just looking at something like that, and it might be more, I don't know the exact number. It's basically a lot of people are involved today in order to get a deal closed, especially post COVID, um, all that CF CFO, you know, the CFO is going to be involved in your deals, right? You can just expect that. So um, again, this goes back to, you know, sitting down and understanding, like, what are you to expect in a deal? in terms of who needs to be involved, sitting down and coming up with a plan of attack based on that and not just relying on your champion to, you know, do everything for you. Um, having a, you know, having a strong champion is great, but be, you need to be the guide as well, right? Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Champion, 
here's who we really need to have involved if we want to make this deal real. Um, and when it comes to closing bigger deals, uh, I know some people on here can can speak to this, but like we may get lucky and close one, you know, a, a deal or two here with with one or two stakeholders involved. But to really get those large deals, I don't know if you if you all have ever experienced this, but for those larger deals, I've never had just one or two people involved. It's been multiple people. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a must. It's a necessity. It's not going to happen. So if you want to do the land and expand, you know, one small ticket price and then kind of work your way up the mountain, you can do that. But if you want to go for the whole pie initially, right, it's going to need that multi-threading approach. Um, so with that, um, that's that's my biggest piece of advice to take away here, Katie. <laughs> I love that. You guys, this yeah. has been a so much fun. Um, I told Andrew before we hopped on the call, I know some of you have joined me on other events. I said, I don't know if you know what you're in for, because we've got a lot of energy and we pack so much information in. I know we weren't able to cover everything, um, but Alex just threw in um, our LinkedIn profile links for Jamal, Andrew, and myself. Um, also check your email. If you want to review a lot of the stuff that we discussed, everything is going to be sent in a recording within at least 24 hours of the event. Um, and if you liked anything that Jamal and Andrew had to say, ask them. I know Jamal's got a fabulous masterclass that he's got going on. Do you want to spend a minute and kind of share a little bit about that real quick? Sure. The, the masterclass is um, a non-traditional approach to learning how to do super large deals. Uh, somebody told me yesterday, yeah, it's the cheat codes. You're giving us the cheat codes in how to do mega deals. And I'm like, yeah, that, that pretty much is what it is. So it's a, it's a six week program once or twice a week, depending on how you do it. Um, you can, you can book a call with me if you want to talk about it at megadealsecrets.com. Awesome. Yeah. And I know Alex has dropped the link in there as well. Um, and of course he is so fast. He got another link back in there for y'all to go check out. Um, if you have any other questions, don't ever hesitate to reach out to any of us, um, go to saleshacker.com, post questions in our community post. Uh, we have a huge discussion board with over like 70,000 members all over the world that are just willing to answer any questions you have. Um, we have so many other events coming up this week as well and next week. And if there's nothing else, I'm going to let you all go. But this was so much fun. Thank you so much, Jamal and Andrew. And I know I learned a lot. I'm sure our guests did and, and our members did as well. So um, anything else? Are y'all good? Okay. Well, goodbye, everyone. Have a great rest of your Thursday and we'll talk soon.